Welcome to But Jesus Drank Wine and other stories that kept us stuck. I'm Mead. And I'm Christy. And in this podcast, we'll explore the stories that kept us, well, stuck, wanting to drink and not wanting to drink all at the same time. Join us as we show you that freedom from alcohol does not have to mean a life sentence of misery and missing out, but actually means living an authentic life full of peace, joy, and purpose. Hello, my beautiful friend. It's Christy here. Just quickly wanted to pop on here and let you know that my book, Love Life Sober, A 40-Day Alcohol Fast, is now available for order. I will stick a link for you in the show notes. But if you want to head to lovelifesober40dayfast.com, you can get it there on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, pretty much everywhere. I'm really, really thrilled to share this with you, and I cannot wait for you to read it. Thanks. Hello, friends. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. We are so thrilled to be sitting here today with a special guest. Dupe Witherick is with us. Hi, Dupe. Hello. Hello. Hi, Christy. Hi, Mead. So lovely to be here. How are you? We're well. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. For our listeners, Dupe is the founder and executive transformational and well-being coach of Thrive Alcohol Free. She is passionate about helping women unlock their potential by making alcohol insignificant and guides women towards clarity, energy, and purpose. Yes, please. Dupe is also the author of international bestselling and award-winning book, A Cocktail of Clarity, love this, and host of the Thrive Alcohol-Free Podcast. With over 20 years in the corporate world where alcohol often seemed tied to success, Dupe understands the pressures ambitious women face. Her Thrive AF method helps clients break free from these patterns, combining mindset work, nervous system regulation, powerful questioning to build resilience, manage stress, and find balance. Dupe also integrates human design to help women understand their unique strengths and energy, empowering them to make aligned decisions and live authentically. Ah, We are so glad you're here. Dupe, what an honor to have you here today. Thank you so much. We thought it would be fun to... Just open it for your story. Our listeners love hearing relatable stories, and, and, and I know you have one. And so can you tell us what led to all of this amazing work you're doing in the world? Oh, yeah, of course. And it's, and it's always funny, isn't it? Where do you start with the story? There, there's so much. So I suppose there is no rock bottom. There is no road to Damascus. I'll start with that. And sometimes I feel like that's a boring place to start because the story as you hear, you know, the drama and the excitement and and the various things that happened, that that wasn't my story. But hopefully it's a decent story as well. Wow, it's so important. Sorry, I'm already interrupting you, but I it's so important because Yes, those make good movies, but I didn't see myself in any of those stories. And so your story is relatable. Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, so I would have said I was a normal drinker. I was someone with the people that I was surrounded with. It was just something that everyone did. In the UK, it's very much a rite of passage. Alcohol is such a big thing in our society where it's so ingrained everywhere. And I remember growing up with things like Ledettes, which like the, the women keeping up with the men drinking beer, and then you had sex in the city, and it was all very glamorous, and then all those different things that you had. And then I started oh. university, and I remember getting to university, being away from home, you're trying to make friends. You're trying to fit into this new community. And drinking was something that we did at the beginning to really get to know people. Everything seems to revolve around drinking. So your mind says drinking means socializing, means doing various fitting in, means confidence, means all those things. And I vividly remember at university, which is obviously now on reflection, um, something that probably led to that mindset which we were in a hall of residence that's where we stayed for our first year it was here about 180 people in that hall of residence and i remember two girls not drinking and those two girls were ostracized no one spoke to them they didn't seem to have any friends we thought they were boring so then that's where the concept of if you 
don't drink, you're boring. If you don't drink, you have no friends. If you don't drink, you don't fit in. And so subconsciously, and I would say I know all of that, the brain of all the girls and all the limiting beliefs and all of that now, but subconsciously, we, those thoughts stay with you. And so actually drinking becomes a norm. And throughout university, I, I, I worked hard, but I played hard as well. And then went into the city of London, into the corporate world. And I've been in, I was in that world for over 20 years. And again, socializing, team socials, networking, client dinners, business travel, all the things tended to revolve around having a glass of wine. It, that was just what you did. I remember probably in about 2017, 2018, leading a team. And someone in the team came to me with an idea for a social event. And they said, would it be possible for us to do something that doesn't revolve around drinking? Can we do something different? And I remember thinking, that's great. Yeah, let's do that. But just make sure there is somewhere for people to drink. I happy to do bowling or whatever that is. But make sure there's a bowl. And it was, you know, it's all about, I think, the perception and what we thought was normal. And then I've got a 10 year old daughter. And so when I, the whole mummy wine culture then became a thing as well. And mummy needs wine. You deserve wine. You've had a day with a child, so you must drink all of these things. And, and even if you think about like little things like cards, birthday cards, you can't get a birthday card without some reference to alcohol. You get messages from restaurants and things that you've been to saying, it's your birthday, come and have a glass of Prosecco with us to celebrate. And so it's just everywhere. And so for me, I never really questioned it. And I enjoyed it. And I just didn't think anything of it. But then towards my late 30s, I started, I was drink. I remember drinking, I always drank heavy red wines. That was my drink. That was my go-to. I couldn't drink heavy red wines towards my late thirties. I would drink a glass of the full body Rochefort or a Malbec or something. And I just couldn't stomach it. My body was, I could feel my body was probably rejecting it. In hindsight, my body was rejecting it, but obviously I just was like, I'm not enjoying this anymore, but I'm forcing myself to do it because it's a habit. Everyone expects me to drink glass of wine. So I'm going to have a drink glass of wine when I go out with my friends or when we go for dinner. And that was just what I did. But I wasn't enjoying it. So I thought, so instead of thinking, oh, I won't drink, because that never crossed my mind, it was, I'll have the lighter red wine. So I started drinking the Pinot Noirs and thinking, okay, they're a bit lighter, that'll be all right. And I probably did that for a little bit. But then I thought, I can't drink those either. So I'll go to the white wines. And I was never a white wine drinker. I know Bridget Trick Jones is a big thing, but I was never a white wine drinker. And I just thought, okay, this is really odd because I've always liked wine. I have to drink something when I'm going out and meeting people. So what do I do? Anyway, I got to the point where I probably was only drinking, this is going to sound so pretentious, but I was only drinking champagne and gin and tonic. They were the only things I could drink, but I could just about stomach. Fast forward to October, 2020, I started getting a real sense. We'd obviously we were in COVID at that point. It had been a strange year for everyone. We were at home, but obviously drinking at home had become normal because that's what you do. We were living at work, not working from home. And it was a way a cut off. And it, it, it just got to the point where I thought, I'm not looking after myself. And I was the people who purposely try to even so I was telling everyone to look after themselves, go for walks and Look after your well-being and make sure that you're eating, make sure you're not on the screen, not on Zoom all the time. And I was doing the complete opposite. And I then said, okay, what needs to change? And I thought one of the things was probably taking a break from alcohol. I got a real sense. It was probably the Holy Spirit telling me, take a break. And at the same time, the church that I was at the time was doing a 21-day fast or 21 day give something up for 21 days and so I said okay I won't drink alcohol I was felt really strongly about it and I've never been able to do a dry January or Lent I always start off with the right intention and then it would get to the weekend of the first week which 
And I generally say, oh, I don't see well. I've had a whole week without drinking. And so on, I'm sure I could drink on Saturday. And then I'll go back to it, not drinking on Monday. But by the time you get to Monday, I wasn't, you know, I'd failed. And I was beating myself up. And I was like, there's no point in even trying now because I've broken the promise that I said I was going to do this. So I'm not going to do it. And, and so instead, so this time around, I had a real sense that actually taking a 21 day break would be good. I had a real sense that alcohol was beginning to just not. It, as it, it was a bit, but it wasn't serving me. And then when I made that decision to stop drinking, I had this weird thing say, the truth will set you free. And I had no idea what that was or what that meant. And free from what? I had a good life. I was enjoying family, friends, and we could travel. Obviously, at that point, we couldn't. But doing, doing things, we were, it just wasn't, there was, job was good blah 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 but the truth will set me free so anyway I was I the day before I stopped drinking the 8th of November 2020 it was the day before it was the Sunday and I said well as a last hurrah I'll have a glass of champagne I opened a whole bottle of champagne and I'm like what a waste opened a bottle of champagne poured it this is going to be my last hurrah 21 days and then I'll be back to it but I'll moderate or I'll do something it's only going to be 21 days but I will do the 21 days I said to myself Poured this glass, had a sip, maybe two sips, and my stomach started churning. And I started thinking, this really is something I need to do. There's something here that I never reacted to champagne, but this was like, there's definitely something now that you need to think about. And so I took that 21 day break, and a few things happened in those 21 days, which made me think, let's keep going. And it's going to be four years of the 9th of November, so in a month's time. So, yeah, I'm not drinking. Okay, that's so just, I don't think we've ever heard a story like that, where it's just almost so clear that this is what you should be doing. Like, the voice of the truth and then the stomach thing. And, oh, my gosh, that is so wild. That is so wild. So then how did you get to a point where you started this business and all the things that you're doing now, how did it go from that 21 day reset or fast to where you are now? It's odd because if he, he's <laughs> awesome me four and a half years ago. I feel the exact same way. I'm like, what am I growing? Am I really, is this really happening? Is this my dog? What? <laughs> yeah. If you said to me four and a half years ago, would you? Would you be advocating people not drinking? You are not. Would you have written a book about thriving alcohol free? No. Would you have a business called Thrive Alcohol Free? No, it wasn't on the radar. And I probably would have poured another drink and said you were crazy. So for me, it's, it, it is quite bizarre, but I absolutely believe in where I'm meant to be. And I want to help as many people as I can to see that they're not giving anything up by stopping drinking they're only gaining. And within those 21 days, a few things happened that made me think I should stay on this journey. And one of, and so the first couple of weeks, I hate to, I, I'm trying, I always think when I tell this story, the first two weeks were pretty shocking, pretty tough, sleeping lots, going to bed early, not feeling great, drinking tea, coffee, water. That was it. Didn't know anything about alcohol-free drinks or anything like that. Felt probably like, like I was white knuckling it a bit. Just, I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it. But then I discovered a TED Talk. And it was all about grey area drinking. And I'd never heard this concept that there was a spectrum, that you didn't have to wait until you hit rock bottom, that you can just, if you're drinking and it's not serving you, then you're allowed to do something about it. But that, that just didn't. That just wasn't even on my radar. And then I had listened to another TED talk and then I discovered a podcast and started hearing these stories about people who had taken a break out of jewelry. So that I was, and it slowly piqued my interest. But the one thing that really stuck with, sticks with me at that time that happened was I remember reading an article about an alcohol pre fizz and it was a wine sort of journalist who was 
knew all the wines, all the, the brilliant wines of the world. And she said in this article, this is the best alcohol free fizz that I have ever tasted. You must try it. And I was reading this article and I didn't even know how I stumbled across the article. It's a bit like the podcast. I don't remember how I came across any of these things. I feel like they must have just landed somehow. And and I remember thinking, this looks really familiar. This bottle looks really familiar. Why does it look familiar? And then I remembered I had a bottle. I had the bottle in my cupboard. And so rewind, because obviously why would I have an alcohol free bottle? <laughs> Right, my cupboard. I shouldn't. But that summer, someone had come. So the August, this was obviously November, the August, someone had come to our house for lunch or dinner and brought this bottle of wine. And I remember that obviously not saying to that person that brought it, but to my husband, what the hell? Why have you why have they brought me this? Especially as they proceeded to drink my wine. I was like, how is And so I then so then I I thought, I'm sure we've got this in the cupboard. Rummaging through, uh, through the cupboard, at the back of the cupboard was this bottle, and it was like it was waiting for me, and it was waiting for me to be ready to try it to see. And I thought it's going to be awful. It's going to be awful. At the time, there was probably only seed lip. That was a pop, one of the popular drinks. That there was nowhere near the alcohol-free drinks that you have now. It wasn't a thing. It was just... So I'd heard seed that was awful. I expected this to be absolutely awful. But we were doing a girls' night on Zoom, as you did at the time, and everyone was drinking champagne or Prosecco or whatever. And so I poured a glass of this and I thought, I'm going to pretend, because I hadn't told anyone that I wouldn't drink it. I was just doing this on my own. I told my husband, obviously. No one else knew. And I poured this glass and then we all went, cheers, like how I sit over at the wall. Oh, this is quite nice. And that flick of, actually, I can drink something. I can feel like I'm fitting in with everybody else because it looks like I'm drinking the same thing. I'm having an adult drink. I'm not just drinking water and tea and coffee. And I feel good the next day. What's alcohol actually giving me? And that was a revelation and that was the start of my journey. And I, since then I explored lots of alcohol free drinks. I'm so pleased with the number of drinks that are available now, options to give people and to make it much more socially inclusive. And I was also a judge on the World Alcohol Free Awards this year. And that was amazing because it showed we, we had drinks from all over the world and I tasted about 50, over 50, 50 different drinks, blind tasted those drinks and then we, we gave them our scores and everything else. And it was fascinating. Sorry, I, I absolutely love it. I love the fact that you can keep the ritual and change the ingredient. And so it's, that's become my sort of love, but that was a real game changer for me. And then I found a, a gin that I liked as well. And so then it was like, I've got the two things that I was drinking. It doesn't feel like I'm not drinking. Actually, life's getting, life feels easier. I feel calmer. I feel more at peace. I feel better in myself. And, and then from there, and then I joined a community and I did a course and I did all sorts of things. And so got very obsessed with the whole alcohol free movement. And as I was feeling great, I wanted to share it with everyone. And so I was on a mission to let people know. And so that's probably what led to me then coaching and originally I did a coaching qualification in the January of 2021 which was transformational coaching qualification um because I've been coaching and mentoring for many years in the corporate world and it's my favorite was my favorite part of my job and so I thought and I'd always thought oh I need to wait until I retire to become a coach I need to have the wisdom of but anyway it's all rubbish we all think we're too young too old too this too that can't do things when you stop drinking, you realize you can do anything and it makes you brave. And so, yeah, so I did that. And then as I was going through this qualification, I was thinking, gosh, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. I wonder if I could weave in some alcohol free things into this. But at the same time, I was offered an amazing job opportunity. I started running. I started doing yoga. I, I was just doing lots of different things. And life was beginning to feel like it was a lot more varied a lot more open or I think 
work, family were the only things in my life. And actually now there's so much more. And reading, I became this prolific reader. I hadn't, that year, I remember reading more books in that year than I had done probably in the past 10 years. And obviously that probably inspired me to then write a book. And, and, and so it's all, it, it was a lot of things that happened over the course of a couple of years, two, three years, and we're obviously year four. And it just felt like it was getting, each year it got, it just gets better and better. So I've probably ranted, rambled a bit, but well, yeah, that's what led to me being here. It's so good. And it's such a great reminder that we think we have this fear and this assumption that our life is going to get smaller when we start, when we stop mm -hmm. drinking, when we ditch alcohol and it just becomes so much bigger and so much more as you so lovely, eloquently put it like varied. So I know that one of the things that you do with the gals that you work with is help, help women find kind of their passion. So let's talk a little bit about that. If for the gal, and cause this has happened to me and I'm sure you too made like gals that we have coached who are like, I don't even know what I like. I don't remember my only hobby is going to have some cocktails. And so what would you say to that gal who's, I don't even know what I'm passionate about. How do I find that out? So true. We lose it. Same way. We lose the passion. And I always talk about, it's similar, it's also the emotions as well. That's a big thing. And I work with people on managing and processing emotions. So obviously they all come up and they're raw and real. <laughs> you have to really sit with them now. You haven't got anything to dub out with. I always talk about how we numb negative emotions, but then also numb, we're numbing the positive emotions as well. And so the thought of a passion or finding joy in something is completely alien. And what I say to that is sometimes we have to, some people are imaginative and they say, okay, I'll try this or I'll do that. But a lot of the time I say, go back to what you liked doing as a child before you were drinking. As a child, as a teenager, we used to have lots of fun. Without you know, that we forget that. And especially if you've been drinking for 20, 30, 40 years, it is tricky to remember what you used to do. So I say, go back to that and see if there's anything that you enjoy. And then if not, look around and see what people are doing. And I have a, a guide, which are 30 ideas to passions and hobbies, which I'm happy to share with your, with your audience. But just to give them some ideas, but try painting, try, try reading, try running, try swimming, just do, just try a lot of stuff and don't feel, because the other thing is when people start new hobbies or passions, they think I have to do it. I have to keep going and I hate it. And actually you don't, it's all about giving yourself permission to embrace something new, try it for a little bit. If it doesn't, if it doesn't light you up, you can stop. <laughs> If no one's saying you have to do anything, you could absolutely stop, but at least give it a go and then see what lands. Yeah. It's, it's like we, we always just say, like, it's the work that we get. It's the work that we get to do on the other side of freedom from alcohol is like, we get to discover what we actually enjoy doing. And I always say this too, like finding freedom from alcohol is like the greatest time hack. Everybody's out there trying to find the way to create more time in their day to have the thing, time to do the things they want to do. Fighting from freedom, freedom from alcohol is that thing. It opens up this space in this time because your mental isn't so focused on it. Yeah, all the things we all know that we've covered a million times in this podcast. But, but what I love about what you're saying is there is that space and that time, just like you noticed with running and reading and then leading to writing a book. That's the stuff that I just want to emphasize for our listeners too, that becomes the stuff that brings joy, not because we know what that thing is that's going to be our new hobby, but it's like in the process of discovering that because we have this freed up mental space and time. Yeah. They yeah, absolutely. And it is people ask me all the time this they do people say you couldn't have taken up that much time drinking. <laughs> and actually the amount of mental capacity it takes and not just the physical is I think people think who drink, they think that it's just the act of drinking. So it's that getting to wherever you are, having those drinks, and that's it. But actually, there's a whole thing about it. And even no matter how much you drink, even if you drink a little bit a day, it takes you a certain amount of time for your body to actually get back to you being normal. And so actually, if you drink regularly, 
you're never actually getting back to your normal. You're constantly, you're not there. It's not. And actually, if you've been drinking for 20, 30, 40 years, you probably don't even know who your normal or what your normal is because you haven't given your body that chance to get there. And so, yeah, I think that's probably important to mention, but there's a lot of mental capacity that's taken up. There's a lot of just the way our body has to work so hard to process the alcohol as well, let alone the actual, just the act of drinking. So when you stop and you do have all this time, all this mental capacity to do something different and enjoy it and know that you can do it. It's a domino habit because if you can, if you're someone who already exercises, if you're someone who already eats healthily, if you're someone who already does a few things, by ditching alcohol, you're actually then allowing yourself to be more consistent. You're allowing yourself to be, to do more, to find the time and, or to have the time and to not feel like you're having to do things, but you get to do things. That's true. So good. Can you give us, uh, our listeners, a little teaser about your book, A Cocktail of Clarity? I love the title. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, again, I wanted to write, I'd read quite a lot of Quit List. And I loved, there's so many good ones out there. So many amazing books. And obviously, our oh, Christy has got the fabulous book out as well. So fantastic. But, and I love that because everyone has different stories and has something different to say and people resonate. And, and there's always something you'll take away. I think regardless of what the story is, there's some, there is a takeaway in all of them. But for me, when I wrote the book, I didn't see many people, which is why I started the conversation the way I did. I didn't see many people who hadn't hit a rock bottom who were writing about not drinking for the sake of choosing not to drink. Fundamentally, if I wanted to, I could go and have a drink tonight. It would be a complete waste of time. I wouldn't do it. But mm. there was no reason, there was no reason for me to not drink other than obviously seeing now all the benefits for you later and knowing why would I go back it would make no sense but there weren't many stories about that and so I wanted to run write a book that gave permission to people who might be thinking I don't just I'm not that bad I don't drink that much oh my I'm not on the park bench anywhere there's I'm not AA I don't need to go to AA but are still in their minds thinking this, there's something not right. I'm waking up at three in the morning. I'm not feeling great. I'm berating myself. I'm anxious the day after. And all these things that happen, regardless, actually, you don't need to be drinking huge amounts. I'm not sleeping well. I'm, I'm using it as a crutch to help me with X, Y, and Z. And I wanted to, so I wanted to write about that. And I also wanted to have a really positive spin on it. So I didn't want people to think that by ditching drinking, they are then not able to live and not able to socialize and not able to do. And so the strap line of it is how to ditch drinking, embody a joyful new identity and thrive alcohol free. Mm -hmm. It takes you on a journey. So with all of those things, with how to ditch drinking is foundation, how to embody a joyful new identity, then moves into first. So how do you get through alcohol free first? How do you navigate those relationships? Uh, people that may still be drinking around you, especially if they're your partner or all close friends, etc. How do you then start to create, have that alcohol free toolkit as well, which will help you to stay on that pole? How do you build in those healthier habits and routines and passions and hobbies? And then we move into freedom. So foundation first and freedom. And the freedom is really the thriving alcohol free, which is my favorite topic because I want everyone to not just survive alcohol free, but to thrive alcohol free. And so that's really integrating everything you've learned in those first two stages and then helping you think about how best to manage and process emotions, how to determine what your core values are, where you are now in your life versus where you want to be. What are the goals you have for yourself? And then what's the big vision? What's the big dream? Where do you want to be? How do you fully embody this alcohol-free identity and get excited about it? And so the book is very much 
weave it in my story, of course, but it's a really practical guide. At the end of each chapter, there are questions and an action to take and, and a little quote to inspire and take you on that journey. And I wanted it to be accessible for everyone because not everyone's going to be able to do coaching or anything like that. And that's why I, I wrote the book. And then there's also an online course, which is companion to the book if you want to learn in, in a slightly different way. I love that so much. I think it's it's just, it's so important to have resources, practical guides, like both of y'all have published your, both of y'all's beautiful books that represent stories that aren't the, what we talk a lot here about the stories that kept us stuck. So like I used to justify like having a, a headache going to church on a Sunday morning, but having stayed up too late the night before and drinking too much wine, but Jesus drank wine. That was a story that kept me stuck in that kind of conflict around it and stuck in that cycle. And, and I also had a story once I became aware of it of, but my drinking, it doesn't look any different than anybody else's. And it is, and then everything else on paper, like my life looked great from now. So I did not look like someone who had a problem with drinking. I didn't have a problem with drinking, except for the fact that it was just taking up so much meant all the things that we've already talked about. But what I love is being able to have other people's stories that help us rewire the stories that keep us stuck with say you have to have a rock bottom in order to do something about this and then be forced to do something about it versus we can choose a life of freedom from alcohol we can choose to be non-drinkers very counterculturally in a, in a very boozy culture and with practical guides like y'all have given us and blessed us with th there's a way to do this and also don't just take it from us try it and See for yourself. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I say to people, look at it as an experiment. Yeah. Always don't look at it as forever because you never know what's going to happen. But look at it as an experiment. Go to a bar as well and not don't drink and watch people around you and, and see what happens in the night and then chat to people and realize that they're saying the same story over and over again and things like that. And just play with it because... I think the other thing that keeps people stuck is that they think moderation is better. And mm -hmm. I think moderation is fine if you think that's the way you want to go. I, I don't believe it's the best way. I think you want to get rid of it completely. But I say, if you want to moderate, then I would ask you to do this. Over the next month, what are your rules? If your rules for moderation are... I don't drink during the week. I have two glasses of wine on a Friday. I have one glass of wine on a Saturday. And I don't drink on a Sunday. They're your rules. And then experiment and monitor it. Because I tell you what, there's going to come a Wednesday where you come back from work, you had a rubbish day at work, and actually all you want is a drink. And you're either going to sit there and feel miserable because you can't yes. have that drink. Or you're going to reach for the drink and then you're going to berate yourself because yes. you've broken promises to yourself and then you're sort of, it hits your self-esteem and your confidence and everything else. And so if you can do a month with your moderation rules, crack on, keep going. But if you can't, think about maybe taking a bit of a break and seeing what happens. Did you read my journals from when I was stuck in the drinking cycle? Because that is like... You just described exactly, I literally was having a visceral reaction to what you said, like being transported back to that time and all of that effort that went into moderating and all of that, oh my gosh. And then it was, and then like you said, and then Wednesday comes around or Thursday is, Thursday's not the weekend. And I said only the weekend, Thursday's Little Friday. It's Little Friday, so it counts. Sunday was not the weekend, but it still is because the week doesn't start till Monday. All of this, and then you break the, and then you get is that cycle and yeah oh my gosh I'm literally like I can feel it in my body being back in that place and how exhausting it was and how I lived there for so long I'm just yeah I'm so relieved that we we have found a, a better way of being able to do it and being able to you talk about choice and I think that is just so important like that is something I stayed stuck for so long thinking that I just had to wait till it got worse and then I'd be forced or I could and I that was miserable or then I could just, or I would just stay drinking and be miserable. Either way was miserable, but this is 
not just a better way, like it's a way to like actually thrive and live the full life. So, so good. I love it. Is there a, we could go so many different ways with this and maybe the tiny Tina is that moderation experiment that you just said, but if there, Mm -hmm. is there another like tiny new action you would leave our listeners with? I love that. I think do the moderate, if you are there, if you're really thinking about this thing and it's playing on your minds and you don't want to take that break, but you're convinced moderation works, try it. Do that experiment for a month and see what happens. So good. Do can you tell everybody where to find you? And we'll put everything in the show notes too. And we'll maybe link that. What did you say it was? The 30 ways to find your passion or something? 30 ideas for passion for copies. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. Different things if you're not sure what you want to do. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. But also tell us tell everybody where they can find you too. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So it's thriveoutcallfree.com. It's at thriveoutcallfree for Instagram. I am on TikTok-ish. Not free. Not much, but ish. And it's Thrive Out Free podcast. And it's Cocktail of Clarity book. And so you can, you can find all of that if you go to the website, thriveoutcallfree.com. And I'll also, I'm also really excited about a retreat. I'm doing a retreat next year, the Finding Retreat, Finding Freedom Retreat for the Thriving Woman. And that's in Bali next, next summer, it's next June. So if anyone's interested in that, then we can say find that on the website. That's amazing. so amazing. Cool. Amazing. Thank you, Dupe. That was so good. I loved it. I love how you started off by being like, my story isn't, and I'm, but then it was like the coolest story with so many things that we actually hadn't heard before so thank you thank you thank you always love finding other women other christian women and christian women that are here in the uk with me so so fun to have a new friend thank you for blessing our listeners and with your story and your time and your wisdom and can't wait to explore your all your resources thank you so much and thank you for having me on it's been an absolute pleasure and it's been lovely to talk to you both christy and me thank you thank you so much Bye, right, y'all. Y'all. We'll see you next Monday. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. You can find all of our episodes at butjesusdrinkwine.com and be sure to follow us over on Instagram, Love Life Sober, and I'm Not Sober, I'm Free. To learn more about what we do, you can visit our websites, meetholandshirley.com and lovelifesober.com. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to subscribe to our pod so you don't have to worry about missing a single episode. And if you love what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. This helps more women who are feeling stuck and alone in the overdrinking cycle find hope and encouragement. Thanks, ladies. We so appreciate you. And we'll see you next Monday. Monday.